Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala, and you might remember that a little while back I did a tier list ranking up a bunch of old Nick Jr. shows, which if you haven't watched, you should go watch it. Now, from watching that video, you might have gotten the impression that I was a pure Nick Jr. kid, watching all the Nick Jr. shows, I knew all those shows, I had watched all those shows, even the ones that nobody else remembers, I remembered. But, the thing is... While I did watch a lot of Nick Jr. as a kid, at the same time, there was another channel with Jr. in the name that I also watched a lot. Of course, I'm talking about Disney Jr., which is essentially the Disney Channel equivalent to Nick Jr. Originally, it was called Playhouse Disney, but in 2011, they rebranded to Disney Jr., and I honestly don't have any memories of watching Playhouse Disney. Though, I probably did, it's just I was too young to remember it. But anyways, back to Disney Jr. I don't know if I watched Disney Jr. more than Nick Jr. as a kid, or if their branding was just more memorable to me, but I definitely remember their branding a lot more than the Nick Jr. branding. But with Nick Jr., for the first couple of years, they just kept basically the same branding as Noggin. All the same bumpers, same music videos, they even kept the old mascots, Moose and Z. They just slapped the Nick Jr. logo on it, basically. And I like that branding, but then around 2012, I guess, like, pretty much every children's network near the start of the 2010s decade, they decided to rebrand and replaced it with this branding where most of the bumpers were the characters from their different shows in this CG environment. And that branding's pretty nostalgic to me, but in hindsight, it is comparatively a lot more bland when compared to what came before it. Disney Junior, I remember they had those little bumpers where each show was represented by a little Mickey Mouse head with characters from the respective shows inside of it, and they'd have little skits where they went on adventures and were actual characters. But I could talk about old TV bumpers for hours. Let's actually get into the tier list. Similar to Nick Jr., along with shows that just premiered on Disney Jr., we've also got some shows that started on Playhouse Disney, but then continued making new episodes on Disney Jr., and we have some shows that aired entirely on Playhouse Disney, but then were re-ran on a 24-hour Disney Jr. channel, and we got some shows that were made by different companies, but then ended up getting acquired to air on Disney Jr., and also similar to the Nick Jr. tier list, it's all shows that aired on the 24-hour Disney Junior channel from its launch in 2012 to 2014, since that's around the time I would have stopped watching. The only thing that I decided not to include was any of those old Disney cartoons that they used to re-air on Disney Junior at like 3 in the morning. So, you know, like L Lilo and Stitch, Timon and Pumbaa, etc. This also doesn't include any of the little shorts they used to show between commercials because yeah, Disney Junior used to show a lot of little shorts between commercials, but don't worry, I will talk about those in some form in this video, you'll just have to wait. Anyways, I've already been blabbing for more than three minutes, which is somehow two more than the Nick Jr. introduction. So, let's actually start with the tier list. We've got 30 shows, so not as many as the Nick Jr. one, and our first show is Stanley! This is one of those old Playhouse Disney shows they used to rerun, and this one I remember coming on like right before I had to go to school. So like as I was getting ready for school, I'd watch this show. It's about a boy who kind of looks like Charlie Brown, except if his head was extremely deformed, so it's literally like a pentagon. And he has a talking fish, and every episode he has some sort of problem and to fix it he goes inside the big big book of everything which always triggers the amazing music number sung by his cat and dog it's the great big book of everything with everything inside see the world around us this book's the perfect guide goes inside to find an animal who can help him with the problem but then he ends up finding a way to solve the problem without the animal and yeah it's a great show yeah i don't really have that much to say about it it's kind of like a lot of those nick jr shows it's just a nice calm chill little show the theme song's pretty dang good it's by a baja men with the people who sing who let the dogs out that's right it's my man stanley oh yeah it's my man stanley welcome to stanley's world 
pretty good stuff. So, I'll put it in B tier. Next, we have Special Agent Oso, which, you know, it's only the second show and we are already at one of the real heavy hitters. Basically, it's a show about this teddy bear who's a secret agent. And in every episode, it starts with him having to do some training exercise. And he always fricks it up. But then they send him to do some special assignment. It's always just to help some kid do some very minor, simple tasks. Like brushing their teeth or tying their shoes. You know, simple stuff that you usually learn right when you come out of the womb. And it's always in three steps. Because apparently everything can be done in three steps. Even though... I don't think it's really true, but anyway, it gives us the great Free Special Step song, so that's something. Three special steps, that's all you need. Three special steps, and you'll succeed. Oh yeah, and he's also got his weird little smartwatch, Paw Pilot. But anyways, always very simple tasks, right? Except he still somehow manages to always frick them up, and usually the kid ends up just finding out on their own, while he just stands there and screws everything up. And they usually end up telling him how to do it. And he always ends up using what he learned from that scenario to complete his training exercise. I don't know why that they keep him around since he's a complete screw up. Something else that is weird is that the kids just always know who Oso is. And so do their parents. And it's like, how do they know who he is? Have they met before? Are these missions actually just set up by the agency to get Oso off their back? But enough conspiracies. You've also got your side characters like Wolfie and Dottie, Yosef's co-workers. Wolfie's a wolf, I mean, he's voiced by Mr. Mosby from Zack and Cody. Why don't we just relax and turn on the radio? Would you like M or F? And his catchphrase is, ahem, a woot stand-in. Outstanding, Oso. Ow. Yeah, it's like a pun on outstanding, but since he's a wolf, he's a woot standing. Even though it doesn't really make that much sense when you think about it. You've also got the agency scientist Bufo. He's some sort of buffalo creature. Oso's helicopter Whirly, who for some reason has a beak and is always mishearing Oso and nearly kills him in every episode. Gosh, the ground's all white here. Oh, the ground right here. You got it. No, I, I said it's all white here. Whirly! Oso's strangely French train rapide. Mr. Dose, the leader of the agency who we never see in person, and his name literally means Mr. Two, which is pretty funny. And Oso's name also just means bear. The show had a crossover with Handy Manny, which I don't remember ever seeing on TV, but I'm sure if I did see it, I would have loved it. Oso's an easy S tier for me. I've seen a lot of people who think that Oso is annoying just with how stupid he is. But honestly, he's way too nice of a character to not like, and I just remember watching a lot when I was a little kid, so, you know, nostalgia. PB and J Otter. Now, this show I only just barely remember seeing pretty early in the morning on Disney Junior, and I don't really remember any of the episodes from when I was a little kid. But basically, it's about these three little otters named Ahem. <clears throat> Peanut, Jelly, and Baby Butter. Just amazing names. But basically, they just go on little slice of life adventures in their town called Lake Hoo-Ha. It's another very simple show. Another just nice, calm, chill show. Another really good theme song. <laughs> Plus, whenever the characters need to think of how to solve a problem, it triggers the Noodle Dance, which is also a great song. The show also had a bunch of side characters. Just in the episodes that I watched for this video, there was the Watch Bird. In the episode I watched, she had to stay over with them and was super overprotective and also sang a weird song. Be safe, be sweetie, good night, dream sweetly. The Watch Bird is watching. 
And there's also this doc who's really annoying and that is fine and it's signed and by the way it's all mine. Shut up! These two snooty poodle twins. Yeah, it's it's a pretty good show. Uh I don't think it's as good as Stanley though, so I think I'll put it right below Stanley in B tier. Little Einsteins. Now, this is pretty much my favorite show when I was a little kid, so uh, I might be just a little bit biased towards it. Basically, it's about these four orphan children who teach us about the fine arts. Okay, maybe that wasn't the best way to describe it, though I am convinced that these kids are orphans since we never see or hear about their parents. Though, then again, episodes do begin and end with them opening and closing the curtains, so does that mean the whole show was just a stage play? But basically, it's about these four little kids who drive around on their rock and then go on crazy adventures all around the world. You know, the theme song, we're going, we're going on, on a trip, trip in our favorite rocket ship. Perfection. In every episode, they'd come across some sort of art piece of the day or a classical music piece of the day. It was a very music-based show. Little Einstein's is top of the list so far, and I'd be surprised if anything surpassed it. Next, there's Jungle Junction. Now, this show takes place deep inside the jungle, far from anywhere, where apparently there are a bunch of animals who are like vehicles. They're animal-vehicle hybrids. So there's Taxi Crab... Toad, hog, elephant, hippo bus, it's kinda creepy. Let's just say I'm glad that the Jungle Junction isn't real. Though, as a show, it's pretty solid. It's got a catchy theme song, just like all of these seem to have. It's Jungle Junction, it's Jungle Junction, Jungle Junction. And some of the characters are kinda cool, like Taxi Crab, he's awesome. Toad, hog, he's kinda the grumpy one. <laughs> Dance. What? Come on, dance with me, Zooter. There's this one toucan who's a police officer and the crocodile who's a firefighter. This box needs to go to Bongo. Super speedy. I'm gonna put it at top of B tier. Next, there's JoJo, JoJo Circus. Now, I know that a lot of people, when they think JoJo, they think of that. Dumb anime, but this is the real JoJo in my heart. My biggest memories of watching this one are seeing it during the summer, pretty early in the morning, not 3am or anything, probably around 8 or 9, and uh, it was awesome. Again, amazing theme song. Hey, hey! Come on, clap your hands now. JoJo! Come on, jump up! Basically, it's about this little clown girl who lives with her whole clown family in this circus town, and she has a pet line, and she goes to clown school. She's got a cowboy friend, and a friend that's a frog ballerina, and a friend that's a frickin' potato. It's crazy! And the show's in stop motion, which is pretty cool. The episode that I remember the most is the one where everyone's acting stupid, and they gotta get them to calm down and act serious. Good stuff. I'll put JoJo in B tier, right between Jungle Junction and Stanley. It's not as good as Jungle Junction, but I think it's a bit better than Stanley. Higley Town Heroes, another show with a great theme song. This Here in Higley Town, things all jump around, just like the Higley Town Hero. This one's done by They Might Be Giants, who also did a theme song for a certain other show in this tier list that we'll be talking about in, well, quite a while since it's a lot further down the tier list, but yeah, it's them. It's about these five friends who go around and they have problems, so they have to call on one of their Higgly Towny heroes, who are just regular people who are a service to their community, you know, like a firefighter or a mailman, stuff like that. And every time they show up, they have to sing a little song about what they do and who they are. As for the characters, you got Yubi, he's kind of the head honcho, the leader of the group. There's Wayne, he's the nerd one. There's Kip, he's the cool one, you can tell by his clothes. There's Wayne's sister Twinkle, who's basically just a token girl character. She's obsessed with pink and glitter and all that yucky girly stuff. 
She's also kind of like twist from the freshly band in the sense that she's always come up with crazy Wait. ideas that get shut down by the rest of the group because they're too crazy. crazy. Though she's definitely not as bad as twist since she's just a little kid and isn't some grown man acting like an idiot. Usually her ideas are turned down by that stupid squirrel friend who's easily the worst character. She's so annoying and nobody likes her. There's also the pizza guy who's just this grown pizza delivery man who's constantly forgetting about his job just so he can hang out with these little kids. Anyways, Sickly Town Heroes is going into A tier. Next is a show that crossed over with Special Agent Oso oh Handy Manny. Now, there's this common misconception that Handy Manny is a ripoff of Bob the Builder, which it is not okay. Bob the Builder ripped off. Handy Manny. Handy Manny is clearly the superior show. I never watched Bob the Builder. I always watched Handy Manny. If I needed a repair, I would call Manny, not Bob. Though I will give Bob one thing. While the Handy Manny theme song is pretty good. The Bob the Builder theme song is definitely better. It's about this handyman named Manny. Get it? Handy Man E. <laughs> and he lives in the fictional town of Sheetrock Hills where everyone is constantly breaking stuff. So Manny always has to repair their junk. And the town would literally crumble without him. As we see in the few episodes where he dares move away. Or dares to take a break for a day. And these guys' tools are all alive for some reason. There's Felipe and Turner, who are always arguing over which race of screwdriver is better. There's Pat, he's a dumb hammer. There's Rusty, he's a monkey wrench who's always nervous about everything. Uh oh, it's him! And I guess there's also other tools, but who cares about the rest? He's always getting his supplies from Kelly, and let's be honest, even the show never says it, there was definitely something going on between the two of them. And finally, there's Mr. Lopart, who's this bald and middle-aged man who owns a candy store and lives alone with his cat, and also seems to be just a, just a little too close to his mother, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I also just found out that apparently Mr. Lopart's mother is voiced by this same woman who played Spongebob's grandma in Spongebob, which is kinda crazy since Mr. Lopart is played by Tom Kenny, who literally voiced Spongebob. Mr. Lopart is constantly screwing everything up at his candy shop, and then whenever Manny offers to help him, he always turns it down, which only makes it worse. Handy Manny goes in S tier between Little Einstein's and Oso. I feel like it's just a bit better than Oso, though it's pretty close. But I don't think it's quite on the level of Little Einsteins. Next, there's Johnny and the Sprites. It's about this average Joe named Johnny who just came to live in his house in the woods to work on his music on his own. But then he meets these magical creatures called Sprites. And they become friends and sing songs and yeah. The sprites are Ginger, she's the pink one who's always casting spells and always managed to frick up Johnny's life, but it all works out in the end. There's Basil, he's the smart one, and he's voiced by someone very important. There's Lily, a water sprite, and there's Root, who's supposed to be the cute one. There's also Johnny's female friend Gwen, who has a different job in each episode, and Johnny always has to hide the sprites from her. Sage, who is, well, a sage. And Seymour, who's a mole. And the Fuzzies, who totally are not a ripoff of the Upside Down Show's schmuzzies. The parts are pretty cool and the songs are okay. The theme song's iconic, obviously. I'm Johnny and the Sprites. Did you see one Johnny and the Sprites? Could you be one? Some of the episode plots are kind of weird. Like, there's one that I watch where Root gets some sort of disease that makes him squirt glitter out of his belly button. Unfortunately, this is one of the few shows on this list along with 
literally all of the ones in B tier that cannot be streamed on Disney Plus. It is on iTunes and Jungle Junction. You can buy episodes on YouTube, which just makes it even more confusing as to why they aren't on there. So that's unfortunate. The way I watch it is that there's this DVD of it that I bought a while ago for an old video that is not up anymore. And no, there's not some big dramatic reason behind it. It was just really bad, so I unlisted it. You can also find a lot of really low quality clips of Johnny Needs Sprites on YouTube from back when it was on. Johnny Needs Sprites is pretty mid. I'm gonna put it in C tier. Our first our first C tier show. I don't know, maybe I'm missing out on the best episodes. Maybe the best episodes are the ones that aren't available on the DVD, but I wouldn't know since they it's not a Disney Plus! Next show, Imagination Movers. It's about a musical foursome, kind of like the Wiggles, but not as good. They're still pretty cool, though. You got Rich, the leader. Dave, he's an inventor. Smitty, he's a cowboy. He's pretty cool. And then you got Scott, who is easily the worst one. He is just an ugly hipster, and... He is basically the twist of the group, constantly spouting dumb lines and never being helpful at all. But besides Scott, it's pretty good. Every episode, they solve people's problems in their idea warehouse. One of the people they help a lot is their female friend Nina, who is the niece of the best character, Dr. Knitknots. His whole thing is that he's extremely boring and hates the movers, and I love him. And there's also their annoying talking mouse sidekick, Warehouse Mouse. The songs are pretty good too. I mean, not Wiggles good, but still pretty good. Especially, once again, the theme song. And similar to PB and J, there's also a song that the movers sing every episode to come up with ideas, and it is also really good. We need good ideas and we need them now. So put your heads together and we'll write them down. Imagination Movers is going in S for me. Probably between Manny and Oso. Not as good as Manny, but a bit better than Oso. Though, again, very close. Tinga Tinga Tales. Now, a funny story. Back in fourth grade, when we had to write some sort of fable or some sort of myth, kind of like the ones in this show. I don't remember what the one I wrote was, but my teacher was trying to pull up a video demonstrating it, and at one point she accidentally clicked on an episode of this show, and when she did, and when the theme song started up, I started loudly singing along to it. Jingle, jingle, jingle. And then she got angry at me. It's these African-inspired folk tales that try to explain why things are the way they are, like why parrots never keep secrets, or why zebras have stripes, that kind of stuff. It's pretty okay, though it must have left at least somewhat of an impact on me if I felt compelled to sing along to its theme song. So I'll put it in C tier. The animation's got a nice style to it, I think it's inspired by some sort of African art, though it's pretty lousy flash animation. Though, the theme song must be amazing since again, I sang along to it when it came up. What time is it? It's Timmy time! Uh, get it? It's about this little lamb named Timmy who goes to school with all of his little animal friends. And they learn life lessons. It's a very simple show. The characters don't even talk. They just make animal noises. You got the duck, you got the pig, you got the cat, hedgehog, the badger, the goat. And of course, the theme song's bossin. Timmy, it's Timmy. He's a little lamb with a lot to learn. Yeah, there's not really much to this show, but I remember watching it a lot, so it's going right under Jungle Junction. 
Roly poly oly. This show takes place in a dystopian future where all humans have died and all that's left on Earth is robots and inanimate objects are somehow alive. You probably think that's a joke, but we do know that the show does have some weird lore. In episode Let's Make History, you find out that apparently the roly poly planet, which is clearly just Earth, just no more life, well, besides sentient objects. We know from that episode that Earth was discovered by the Captain Space Barnacle Boxy, who was just riding around space looking for a planet with ice cream, and I guess Earth had ice cream. Ice cream outlived us all. Unless Captain Space Barnacle Boxy decided to annihilate all living creatures that were already on Earth to make room for him and his robot buddies. Which, in that case, that's pretty dark. But really, it's about this little robot boy named Oli who lives with his whole family. His dog, his dad, his little sister Zoe, his mom. <laughs> and there's his grandpappy, who's easily my favorite character. Second would be his uncle Giz, he's also really cool. It's very primitive CGI animation, this was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but for that time period, it actually doesn't look too bad. It's got a nice style to it. Top of A tier. Oh, the knots. This is about a team of underwater animals who save little sea creatures. There's Captain Barnacle as a polar bear and a born leader. Quasi, a cat who's a pirate for some reason. Peso, the team's cowardly medic who for some reason when the show is brought over to the US, his accent was changed from British to Spanish. I guess because his name is Peso. What's really weird about it though is that in the US dub, only him and one other character have their voices changed. Everyone else stays the same. So. Why only those two characters, but nobody else? Either dub the whole cast or dub none of them. Anyways, where was I? Uh, okay, there's also Professor Inkling, a genius octopus, Dr. Shellington, a Scottish sea otter, and there's Dashy, their ditzy photographer, and then there's Tweak, a green rabbit girl with a southern accent who fixes things faster than you could say crunchy bunchy carrots. A thing that Cat and Barnacles for some reason really struggles to say. We can put your house back together faster than you can say bunch of munchy crunchy carrots! There's also these weird mutant vegetable creatures for some reason. But of course, the best part of every episode was the Creature Report. Creature Report! Creature Report! I very clearly remember seeing an episode of this show where Captain Barnacles falls into a whale's stomach acid and then they do a little fake out where you think he's dead, but then he comes out just fine. But I cannot find that episode for the life of me. To be fair, I haven't really looked that hard, but, but still. One of you needs to find an episode for me. I thought it was hilarious, but I was like 8 years old, and I need to see it again. Or not, I could go either way. There's also this one other episode that I thought was really funny when I was a little kid, where there's a snapping shrimp when he snaps since the odd knots into a daze, but I've actually watched that one since, so not as important. Top of A tier, what can I say? Octonauts is just a classic. Next is the Koala Bars. Now this show stars koalas, which if you didn't know, I know it's kind of hard to tell. But koalas are my favorite animals, so automatically that puts it in A tier. There we go. It's pretty much the most Australian show you can get. I mean, it's about these two koalas with the most Australian accents ever. We'll look after, won't we, Buster? Of course, we're here to help! We go around helping other Australian animals in the outback. Great characters, great animation, great theme song. I mean, seriously, pretty much all these shows so far have had great theme songs. Call the Koala Brothers, call the Koala Brothers, call the Koala Brothers, call the Koala Brothers! Great 
great show. And seeing that we're halfway through the tier list, I think it's about time for a Disney, Disney Junior Shorts, Shorts of Lightning Round. A poem is interviews with kids about what a poem is, followed by a read of a poem with Disney footage to accompany it. Bunny Town Shorts, the individual segments of the titular Playoffs Disney series, just split up and aired as shorts between commercials. Why they didn't just re-air the full episodes of this show like they did with some of the other Playoffs Disney shows on Disney Junior beats me. Choo Choo Soul, music videos featuring the titular Kids Music Act. All aboard the Choo Choo Train, all aboard the Choo Choo Train. Ooh, ah, and you, short starring these two monkey puppets done by the same people who brought you Mr. Media and Dan O'Lan. No, I am not joking. I'm a the red monkey and the jungle's for me. I'm happy when I'm swinging from tree to tree. I'm the blue monkey and I love to eat. Quiet is. No relationship to poem is. These are just stop-motion music videos are meant to get kids to calm down for bed. Free healthy steps is spin-off, especially in Oso, which I talked about earlier, where Oso and his friends watch these kids do healthy activities. And free steps, of course. Where is Warehouse Mouse says spin-off of the Magic Movers starring the most annoying character. Big block, big block, big block, big block, big block, big block, sing song. It's kind of self-explanatory. The bite-sized adventures of Sam Sandwich, the stop-motion adventures of the superhero Sam Sandwich, and the psychic broccoli lad as they fight off the evils of junk food. And you teach my alligator manners, a series about a young boy has to teach his pet alligator some dang manners. My alligator! Chuggington Badge Quest, a spin-off of the series Chuggington, which don't worry, I'll talk about that later, where the trainees have to do quests to get badges. Again, pretty self-explanatory. Get up and dance a lot with a robot, think it's not. The Dot Files, 2D animated adaptions of episodes of Dominic Stuppins, which again is a series I'll talk about later. Handy Manny's School for Tools, it's Handy Manny's School for Tools. Happy Monster Band, music videos featuring a happy monster band. Jake's Buccaneer Blast, a Lego spin-off of Jake and the Neverland Pirates, which again I'll talk about later. Jake's Neverland Pirate School, Jake's Neverland Pirate School. Lou and Lou Safety Patrol, a series about these two kids who just go around telling people how to be safe. Mama Hook knows best, good god, how many Jake and Neverland Pirates spin-offs were there? Nina needs to go, a series about a little girl who's constantly having to go to the bathroom public, but doesn't know her mom until it's too late, so she's being rescued by her pretty cool grandma. And at the end of every short, she pretends to have learned her lesson, but she never does. That will never happen again because. Because now I know, don't wait to go. It's lies, lies, lies. Playing with Scully, that's four. Four Jake and the Neverland Pirates spinoffs. Hasty Time with Zay Falk, a cooking show hosted by a French dog whose food is constantly almost stolen by this cat named Dom. Mickey's Mouse Size, an exercise program hosted by none other than Mickey Mouse. And Minnie's Bow Tune, the spinoff of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse about Minnie and Daisy running a bow teak. And that's all of them. Well, at least all the ones that were on when I was watching Disney Junior. Normally, I don't really like to do this, but I really feel like I should ask you guys to please remember to like and subscribe if you like my videos. As of recording this, I'm only 9 subscribers away from 500, and when I hit 500, I'm gonna watch Cars 2, as I said in my Despicable Me video, so please, subscribe if you'd like to see more from my channel. Now, back to the tier list. And right when I go back to the tier list, we've got the worst show, Kaden Mim Mim. By the time this show came out, I was pretty much already in the phase of hating every new preschool show that came out, though. Unlike the F tiers for the Nick Jr. tier list, I actually decided to rewatch an episode of this one. I guess because I remember watching it more. Oh, did I spoil it? Yeah, the show's an F tier. It's about this little girl with schizophrenia. I, I mean, it's about this little girl who imagines herself in this imaginary land and all these imaginary creatures. She's got a stuffed rabbit that she plays with and uh, imagines that he's alive. And there's also a bunch of other weird creatures like... There's this weird yellow thing, these weird pink and blue things who are, I guess, brother and sister, and this weird brown thing. It sucks, the animation is unappealing, the characters are annoying, and all the plots are stupid. F tier, easily. Next up, the Hive, or as I like to call it, B-Movie the Series. It doesn't actually have anything to do with B-Movie besides being about talking bees, but whatever. It's funny. It's about this British bee chow named Buzzby, who lives with his whole bee family. You got, you got his sister, Ruby, <laughs> and his other sister, Baby, uh -huh. and uh, Mama and Papa Bee. It's just kind of about his life, going to school and learning life lessons with a bunch of other insects. It's got a kind of nice style to it. The character's got the Rayman hands going on for some reason. But it's not a super memorable show. I definitely wouldn't call it one of the absolute classics. So I'm going to put it between Johnny and Sprites and Tinga Tinga Tales and C tier. Guess how much I love you. This show along with the next show we're going to talk about. I remember coming on like right before I have to go to bed. So I'm pretty nostalgic for it. And rewatching it, yeah, it's a pretty nice show. 
It's based off the children's book of the same name and stars a rabbit, father and son, little nut brown hair and big nut brown hair who live in the wilderness with all their animal friends. And it's just a nice, chill, charming little show. I'm gonna put it in A tier. Next is Gaspar and Lisa, which, as I mentioned, used to show at around the same time as Guess How Much I Love You, and it's even better. It's about these two best friends, Gaspar and Lisa, who are, well, as a little kid I wasn't really sure what they were supposed to be, like, dogs or rabbits, but apparently they are supposed to be dogs, so they're, they're pretty messed up looking dogs. So, they'd also be pretty messed up looking rabbits, so I digress. And what's weird is that them and their families are the only anthropomorphic dogs in this universe. Everyone else is a human. In fact, apparently one episode, Gaspard actually gets a pet dog, which is really freaking weird. Like, at least Goofy isn't the one who owns Pluto and Mickey Mouse. They live in France, they just go on everyday adventures solving catastrophes, as they call them. When rewatching the episodes, I was happy to find that the show is pretty much just as charming and likable as I remember it. The animation leaves a lot to be desired. Like, I know that the other CGI shows on this list don't have the best animation, but this is a whole nother level. But thankfully, it makes up for it with charming and likable characters and stories. Between Gaspard and Lisa, Gaspard is definitely the better one of the two. Pre pretty much everything this kid said made me laugh for some reason. I, I don't know why. He's just awesome, I guess. And you'll love Lila, wait and see. And if you don't, then we'll just give her back. <laughs> That's not to say that Lisa's a bad character, though. She's definitely the weak link when it comes to voice acting. Though, obviously, I'm not gonna be too hard since, you know, it's just a little kid. I also remember them hanging around this boring old dude a lot, who was kind of like Knit Knots from Magic Movers, though not as over the top boring. You know, he wasn't obsessed with the color beige and have a pet rock. He didn't like boxes and stamping, stapling, and stacking papers. Though I do remember he, whenever he'd ask for cake, he always wanted sponge cake. Gaspar and Lisa's going in S tier, not quite on the level of these other classics, but I still really enjoyed revisiting this one. It helps that all the YouTube uploads of this one are Disney Junior errands, and they include some old commercials, so that really adds to the nostalgia of it. I love the elephant now, this was a show that I really liked when I was a little kid, even when I was in my phase of hate and all preschool shows, I still like this one, and honestly, I can't tell you why. And when I say I love this show, I really do mean it. I even embarrassingly wrote some Pooh's Adventure style fan fiction about it. Yeah, embarrassing, I know, but that was how obsessed I was with it. And again, I really don't get it. It's just this show about this weird looking elephant girl who lives like a human woman and has a magic hat that she uses to solve problems. Ella's just kind of a Mary Sue, her guy friend Frankie is an idiot, seriously, in one episode he thinks that a mouse is gonna eat him. Help! Help! The wild mouse is going to eat me! Her friend Tiki is just a complete nerd. In that same episode, they repeat the same joke of her being upset that the mouse ate a book four times. And it's like, we get it, she's a nerd, you don't have to keep repeating it. He's a book-eating monster! But easily the worst character, and the character that I always hated even when I liked this show, is Belinda, who's basically just a spoiled rich girl who usually only ever causes problems, yet the gang decides to always still keep her around, and she has the most obnoxious condescending voice imaginable. Hi, Dad! I mean, Mayor Blue. Oh, shut up, you're so annoying! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always hated that type of character in shows when I was a little kid. Oh, and there's also a running gag of her constantly reminding the rest of the gang that her dad's the mayor, much to their and the audience's annoyance. Well, at least me. The animation is clearly trying to go for a storybook type vibe, pro probably to replicate the book that it was based on with 2D backgrounds and a sort of storybook texture on all the characters, but it's pretty clear they on the budget to really pull it off. Oh, uh, and there's an episode where Ellen and Frankie have to babysit Frankie's little brother, and it is really annoying. Yeah, there's not really anything that bad about the show, besides Belinda, but there's not really anything that remarkable about it either. I mean, the theme song is kinda catchy. 
Though, a lot of these shows have catchy theme songs, and most of them are better than this one. Yeah, I really don't know why I love this show so much. Uh, I'm gonna put it at the bottom of C tier. Not bad, but not really good either. We go from a show that I loved as a kid, but don't really like that much now, to a show that I loved as a kid and still appreciate just as much today. Charlie and Lola. The theme song to this one is pure magic. Pull it up on YouTube, and if you want, make sure to turn on the captions, you won't regret it. It's just a nice little show about a boy named Charlie and his little sister Lola. They always get into very mundane problems, and usually Charlie has to help Lola solve them, and there's usually some imagination sequence in there. It's just a nice show. It goes in S tier between Oso and Gaspard and Lisa. Nice animation style, too. Babar and the Adventures of Badu. Now, you see, this is what elephants look like. You know, the nice, long trunks and really, really, really long um, trunks and actual tusks. That's what an elephant looks like. Not that. I don't know what that is, but that's not an elephant. Even though Babar's in the title, it's not actually about him. It's about his grandson, Badu, and all of his animal friends, and the adventures they go on. There's his monkey friend, Shiku, who just acts like a monkey. His porcupine friend, Monroe, who's just kind of a jerk. And his zebra friend, Zawadi, who's always scared about everything. Oh, there's also Jake, that's a hide and watch episode with him in it. But Wikipedia tells me that he's a main character, so I thought I'd mention him. Easily the highlight is the show's villain, Crocodilus, the kingdom's ambassador who's always scheming to take over the kingdom. He's an evil crocodile with a suit and a funny voice. What else could you ask for? Oh, oh, I got you! He's kind of like Cedric from Sophia the First, which again is a show I'll talk about later. Except they never really try to make him sympathetic, though I sympathize with him. And something weird is that the king is aware of his evil actions, yet he still chooses to keep him around. What's up with that? Is Babar just really that incompetent, or does he just not see Crocodus as a threat? I, I I don't get it. Also, he's voiced by the same guy who voiced King K. Rool in the Donkey Kong Country cartoon, and he's basically doing the same voice. Surely the royal chef can use these to make his scrumptious candied coconut cream cake? General Clump. I order you to seize the coconut! He's also helped by his two nephews, the Lash and Tersh, the, the former of which is just kind of a jerk, but the latter is actually pretty nice and is friends with the other kids and usually only helps Crocodilus out of either his own gullibility or to make him happy. Babar is A tier, only for Crocodilus. Third, Third and Bird. This show's by the same guy that made Wonder Pets and has a similar animation style to it. Except instead of being about free animals who go around saving other animals, it's just about a community of birds. Also, they're British for some reason, though I definitely remember them having American accents, so I, I think I might be watching the original UK dub. I, I don't know how to find up since it's a US dub, but yeah. They go on all sorts of adventures, like in one of them, the little baby bird loses her dolly and they gotta go down to Earth to find it. Then in another one, we find out that their worm friend's aunt is racist towards birds, which in real life would make sense since in real life birds eat worms, but uh, here it's just a lesson about how sometimes different can be good. Easily the best character is Mr. Beekman, their teacher who's a toucan. He's awesome. I'm a toucan who can proudly say I boast the biggest beak. Bottom of B tier. Not, not super iconic, but still pretty memorable. Sheriff Callie's Wild West, a show about a sheriff named Callie, who's a cat. She helps out all her animal friends. They learn lessons. Yeah. She's got her deputy peck, who's a woodpecker that is strangely voiced by the same guy who played Ryan in High School Musical. And he's got his best friend Toby, who's a cactus that is alive for some reason, even though there were other cacti. Well, by alive, I mean he can talk and has a phase. Even though there are other cacti that are inanimate. 
so it doesn't really make any sense. He's also clearly a child, which makes the fact that Peck considers him his best friend kind of weird, though Peck does act like a child most of the time, so it kind of makes sense. Also, rather disturbingly, there's a cow who sells people milk, which is like, where is she getting that from? Is she getting it directly from herself? Kind of gross if you ask me. And this character called Farmer Stinky, who owns other cows who are just regular cows and aren't anthropomorphic, so... Is he the one milking her? Oh, and we get another episode about racism in the form of an episode where everyone's scared of a new wolf in town. And of course, who can forget good old Dirt Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry? The worst characters are easily these stupid prairie dogs who literally just interrupt the episode every once in a while to restate what the characters already said or tell us what we can easily see is happening in song form with chipmunk voices. Cause they love playing in the dirt. They love playing in the dirt. On the flip side, the best character is easily Tio, a wise old Hispanic turtle who is constantly playing checkers with Uncle Bun, a store owner who we rarely actually see running his own store. The animation style kind of reminds me of Autonauts, but how it's kind of in a chibi style and stars anthro animals, and then just like that show, it definitely created some furries. And I just found out today that it's apparently actually from the same creators as Hickley Town Heroes. Crazy, am I right? Though it's definitely not as good as that show. And of course, it wouldn't be a preschool show without tons of singing and dancing, and the songs are okay, I guess, but they're really overly auto-tuned. Sheriff Callie's going in C tier, just above Owl the Elephant. Yeah, this came out kind of late into my watching of Disney Junior, and I mostly just found it stupid, but I still kind of associate it with that classic era for some reason. So, it's not super low or super high, just in the middle. Henry Huggle Monster, a show about a monster child who lives with his monster family in a monster town called Aurorasville. He's got a brother named Cobby, who's some sort of genius inventor, constantly making inventions that drive the plots. His dad, Dado, who's just kind of an idiot. His mother, who's just kind of his mother. And his baby brother, Ivor, who's just a baby. There's also his sister Summer, who I hated when I was a little kid, and would still hate now if it weren't for the fact that she's voiced by Hinden Walsh, so that makes it a bit better. On top of many other iconic cartoon characters, she also voiced the cat in Stanley. In fact, the show has many great voice actors who have been in other shows on this list. You have Laura Jill Miller voicing Henry, who also voiced Lamy and Dr. Stubbins, which, for hopefully the last time, I will talk about now. We once again have Tom Kenny voicing a character, and this show he voices Dado. And hey, the show also has Great Elisle, who, who was also on Handy Manny. And Cree Summer, who voiced Priscilla on Sheriff Kelly's Wild West. But I should probably go back to talking about the characters. There's Henry's best friend Denzel, who's a Duggle monster, meaning he lives underground and travels underground. And his little female friend, Gertie, who I used to hate when I was a little kid, and yeah, I still do now. And his friend Estelle, who's this giant monster who's pretty goofy. There's also this one guy who flies an airship who's constantly mishearing everything that anyone says. Kind of like Worley from Special Agent Oso. And there's this one episode where Summer's singing these songs for everyone, complimenting them, but... He mishears it, so he thinks that she's insulting him, and he gets very triggered. And of course, it wouldn't be a great kid show without some great music. Of course, the theme song's a banger, but another particularly memorable musical number is The Huggle Monster Way, I'm assuming that's what it's called, from this episode where Summer runs away from the family, and then you can tell they want it to be like this big Broadway number where... Henry and Cobby and Subber are all singing about the Huggle Monster way, and there's intersecting vocals at one point, and it sounds really bad. Be 
But, you know, when I was six, it felt very emotional. I think I even teared up a bit the first time I saw it. Uh, I'm joking about that. That'd be super embarrassing if that was true. In fact, in general, I don't really cry at movies or TV shows, but it was pretty emotional, I'm telling you. Cause that's the Huggle Monster way. Hooray, hooray, the Huggle Monster way. Bottom of B tier. Definitely not one of the super nostalgic shows for me, but I still watched it quite a bit. Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Now this is one of those super nostalgic shows to me, and it's going between Oso and Charlie and Lola. It's about these three orphan children who I'm guessing are just some kids that Peter Pan kidnapped and decided to make them the protectors of the island, even though their children. You've got Jake, the born leader of the group, who's got a sword. Izzy, his girlfriend, who's got her pixie dust that the fairies gave to her, but only use it in emergencies. Basically, it just gets them out of whatever problem they're in at the end of each episode. And she's not really his girlfriend, but come on, I can't be the only person who thought there's something going on between the two. It could just be because it's a boy protagonist and a girl protagonist. But just like Leo and June from The Little Einsteins, there is plenty of ship art and ship fanfiction and ship videos of the two of them. So clearly I'm not the only one. And I've also seen some ship art of Jake and that mermaid girl who's voiced by Sophia from Sophia the First. These shows really are just all interconnected, aren't they? And there's Cubby, a coward who has a map. And they're talking Parrot Scully, who's kind of useless. And they've also got their ship named Bucky, who's kinda sorta sentient. They're Pirates really only because they say so. They don't plunder, steal, kill, or do anything else of the sort. In fact, they are very much against stealing. So basically, they're about as much of pirates as Captain Feathersword from the Wiggles or Patchy the Pirate from Spongebob. Opposing them, you have the evil Captain Hook and his first mate. And let's face it, possible gay lover, Mr. Smee. There's also Sharky and Bones, though they don't really do much besides provide some awesome music. I remember the early episodes used to follow a pretty simple formula. The Neverland Pirates would be playing with some toy, and then Captain Hook would see them playing with it, and for some reason want to steal it, even though it's a kid's toy and he's a grown man, and then they'd have to get it back. And of course, who can forget iconic cat phrases like, Yo ho, let's go! and yay hey no way and oh coconuts and crackers but as the show progressed the plot thickened and they introduced a bunch of other characters and there was like a dozen special length episodes and frankly i do not have enough time to go through all of that so let me know if you want to see a full video on this show as I mentioned, the music on the show is actually pretty good. My personal favorites would have to be All Coconuts. All Coconuts. All Coconuts. I guess I'll try again another day. And Castaway Island. That one's just perfect. Makes me die in a salt every time I listen to it. It's a hideaway. Cause we're all castaways. On Pirate Island. And while we're on this subject, I think I should mention this series of music videos that Disney Junior did back in 2015 that would air between commercials, which I didn't talk about earlier since, you know, 2015. After I stopped really watching Disney Junior consistently, but basically what these music videos were is that if you've ever seen a video by the YouTube channel Shmo Yoho, it's kind of like that. They'd remix lines from their shows and auto-tune them and make them into a little song and most of them sounded pretty bad, including the Jake and Emma Pirates ones. But just listening to them, despite how bad they are, it does make me feel 
a lot of nostalgia, not really for the music videos themselves, but mostly just for the show in general. And because the show makes me feel that much nostalgia, I feel like that warrants it being an S tier. And this would be the part where I make some silly joke about how One Piece ripped it off, though if you want that, you can just check out my wiki, which for some reason features a lot of stuff about Jake and Neverland Pirates, despite it not really being one of my main meme shows. But check it out, it's super funny. Sophia the First, it's a show about a girl who's in the village doing all right. Oh, okay, I think I've done that same joke like five times already. Let's just describe it normally. It's about a little peasant girl named Sophia who lives alone with her mom, and no, as far as I'm aware, we never find out who her true biological father is. But it's not really important, so let's just ignore that. But for some reason, the king of the land that they live in, Enchantia, falls in love with her mother. So they get married, and now she's a princess. And you bet that Disney marketed the heck out of this series to little girls. And on the flip side, Duke and Number Pirates was marketed a lot to little boys, and you know what side I was on? I was a manly man, so of course I stuck with Jake and never once even thought about watching Sophia. Girly crap. Okay, as much as I wouldn't have liked to admit it, I did actually watch the show a bit when I was a little kid. Basically, she just goes on slice of life adventures just with some magic elements in there. And of course, she learns some life lessons. She's got a magical amulet which lets her talk to animals, but can also curse her if she does something bad. It can also summon other Disney princesses every few episodes, and you know they marketed the heck out of those. There's also a very major retcon involving the amulet later on, but like Jake and the Pirates, I'm not really gonna go too deep into the lore since that could really be a video on its own. These shows both got really surprisingly convoluted as they went on. There's also Cedric, the royal sorcerer who everyone views as incompetent and is constantly trying to steal her amulet so he can take over the kingdom. He's kind of evil, but not really, since it's shown that the only reason he does evil things is mostly because he has daddy issues and nobody likes him. And he's also shown to have a soft spot for Sophia, which sometimes conflicts with his desire to do evil things. Honestly, he was always the most entertaining character. It helps that he's voiced by Jess Harnell, who obviously gives an outstanding performance, and hey, also voice major characters in Special Agent Oso and Jungle Junction. These voice actors are everywhere, I'm telling you. He's also in the next show we're gonna talk about, Dot McStuffins. And I'm clearly not the only one who likes Cedric. In fact, some, some people really liked him, apparently. Which is why he is, in fact, a Tumblr sexy man. Well, the Sexypedia classifies him as Euclid, which means that he's popular, but his popularity is mostly contained within the Sophia the First fandom, but I still count him as a Tumblr sexy man. He does follow a lot of the tropes, I mean, just comparing him to the Wunzler, they're both well-dressed, pale twink villains who really only do bad things because they have parental issues and secretly have a soft side. And they're both from source material that doesn't exactly ooze sex appeal. That is, unless you're this creep. I'm going to be counting down the top 9 cute characters that I myself, personally, finds to be really adorable from the Disney Junior show, Sophia the First. And I shouldn't have to say this, but just in case, please don't harass that guy, thanks. But anyways, back to the actual show. She's got her stepsister, Amber, who we can just add to the list of characters that I hated when I was a little kid. All female, weird how that works out. And her stepbrother, James, who's kind of a dope. And no, as far as I'm aware, we never find out who James and Amber's actual biological mother is, either. There's the king and queen, who are both pretty flat characters. Oh, and I forgot to mention this, but for some reason, Sophia decides to keep the powers that her amulet gives her a secret from her family, which is confusing for two reasons. One, her dad literally gave it to her, so you'd think he'd have some knowledge of it. And two, they never really explain what the repercussions of her revealing it would be. I mean, everyone in this universe already knows that magic exists. It's not like a hidden thing in this universe. 
There is one special that shows the repercussions of her telling it Amber, but that's because Amber gets jealous of it. I don't really see what the problem would be if she told her parents about it. It also means that there were two Disney Junior shows at a time about a young girl having to keep a magical secret from her family, i.e. Dot McStuffins. Anyways, I've been talking about this show for way too long, especially considering it's not even one of the top tier shows for me. So, let's just talk about the couple other main characters and get this over with. You got Clover, her talking bunny psychic, voiced by Wayne Brady. And Bailiwick, the castle steward who, as we see in the show, is pretty much the only man holding everything together. B tier. Doc McStuffins is about a girl named Doc who with her weird magical stethoscope somehow brings her toys to life and has to fix them when they get hurt. She's got her toys which consist of Lammy, a lamb who's a ballerina and really likes to cuddle people, Stuffy, a dragon who pretends to be really brave but is actually just a coward, Howdy, a hippo who's also a nurse. And Chili, a snowman who's always afraid that he's gonna melt and is just constantly worried about having some sort of illness. And sometimes it's like, oh, I can't feel my toes. It's like, ah, oh, you're so many hot toes, you can't melt, ha 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 He was always my favorite. Also, as seen in the episode Chili Gets Chili, he has pipes. This is cool, crazy stuff, and I'll never get it. And of course, there's a bunch of side characters. There's Squeakers, a squeaky toy who's a puffer fish and doesn't really do anything because he can't talk and just squeak, which is honestly just kind of sad. And of course, like a lot of these shows, you got the songs that they repeated every episode. Of course, there's the theme song, the I Feel Better song, and the checkup song, which brings up some interesting questions about how these toys operate. I'm gonna check your ears, check your eyes, bye. How could they have grown? They're toys. Toys don't grow. I'm gonna listen to your heartbeat, fix you up, ready to go. She's gonna listen to their heartbeats? So, wait, toys have heartbeats? Toys have hearts? Are, are the toy manufacturers putting in internal organs into these toys and that's how they come to life? Again, Lijic and Sophia had started out pretty simple, but then as things went on, they started to get pretty weird. For the last couple seasons, Doc moves into this toy hospital, which is in this alternate toy world, but it's also connected to the real human world. I, I guess it's where toys go when humans aren't playing with them. We find out that Doc's grandma was, was the one who gave her the magic stethoscope, and apparently it's in the family business. It's been passed down like every couple generations. What? And apparently Doc's grandma is getting too old to run the toy hospital, so she's handing it over to Doc, a child. Never a toy to tell, she can just go over to the hospital. You think this would be a problem since she her parents would be wondering why she's gone all the time. And the doc was always just really terrible at keeping the secret anyway. Because I kind of alluded to this earlier, but yes, doc has to keep the fact that she can make the toys come to life a secret from everyone else. Which, to be fair, at least makes more sense here than in Sophia because magic isn't really a thing that's known to exist in the Doc McStuffins universe, so it at least makes sense why they wouldn't know about it. Though, I don't know how Doc's family ever got access to this weird toy magic. In fact, there's one episode where a stethoscope is able to make them go inside a book, a historical book, in fact, non-fiction, and they essentially went back in time. So how many powers does this thing have? But anyway, what I was trying to say is, you think it caused problems because they'd be wondering where she is, but it's okay because no time goes by in McStuffinsville. So basically, Doc could just live there. She could just never come back and her parents wouldn't even notice because to them, it'd be like nothing's happened. Kind of disturbing. Doc McStuffins goes in B tier, right above Sophie. Yeah, they're pretty close, but I feel like I probably watched Doc a little bit more, maybe? 
it's just going there. Let's just say it's going there. And alas, we are finally down to our final two shows. And hey, we've got our last truly S tier worthy show. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, which is going right into second place between Little Einsteins and Handy Manny. It's about Mickey Mouse and all of his friends. You got Minnie, his girlfriend, though. It's the preschool show. They're not really explicit about it in this particular incarnation. Goofy, who in this show is absolutely brain dead. Pluto, who's Mickey's dog, even though Goofy is already a dog. Though, I already pointed out how weird this is. The, the Gaspar and Elisa section so i'm not gonna dwell on it here donald do you know has got the short temper and his girlfriend daisy she's daisy in every episode they go on crazy adventures throughout the clubhouse world learning very basic skills like counting and shapes and stuff and they're helped by their their magical Flying mouse head Tootles, who they summon by saying O oh, Tootles, and is basically the actual hero of the show since he just always has what they need to solve their problems. And later in an episode, when it's his birthday, he gets a face and a voice. And I just gotta say, I liked it better when he couldn't talk. And you got some other iconic Mickey Mouse characters as side characters. There's Pete, who here is basically reduced to just a nuisance at worst. Ludwig Von Drake, who's always building these plot devices. <laughs> Get it? Because they're actual devices, but they're just done to start up plots. And you got Clarabelle, who owns a uh, Moo Mart where she sells muffins and makes great puns like Moo Arvelous. Moo Arvelous. Some of the music is denied, they might be giants, and of course, it slaps the theme song. M I C K E Y. The Mouska Door song. Mouska Mouska And best of all, the hot dog dance. Hot dog. One of their most popular shows, and definitely for a reason. And last, but certainly not least, we've got. Shagginton, which you might be saying, isn't this just that Thomas ripoff? Except, no, it's not a Thomas ripoff. Thomas ripped it off. It is the better version of Thomas. It takes place in a post apocalyptic future where most humans have died out and the few that remain have to serve their train overlords, as well as this weird stoplight lady who is above the train, so you've got a weird hierarchy going on here. I don't really know what she is. Our three main characters are Wilson, a train who probably has ADHD, and C Coco, who I hate very, very much. Again, another character added the pile. And again, a female character. Why is it always female characters? The best of the main characters is easily Brewster, because unlike the others, he's perfectly sane and normal and always says the right thing. And there's some side characters like this old man train who's always like, back in my day! And this Italian ice cream train. I didn't even like this show that much when I was a little kid. I thought it was kind of boring, but. I'm gonna put it in C there anyway, because I think it's funny. And with that, we're finally done with this tier list. That was super long. Somehow 20 minutes longer than my Nick Jr. one, despite having like 10 less shows. I don't know how that happened. I guess I just had more to say about these ones. But hey, at least it means I can finally complete the ultimate bracket. Nick Jr. versus Disney Jr. 
I don't really know what I'm going to do with this bracket. Maybe I could have you guys vote for it on some sort of Google form and post a link on the community tab, which I should be getting soon since I should be getting 500 subscribers soon. As always, remember to like and subscribe if you like my videos and want to see more of my videos. Especially go check out the Nick Jr. tier list since that's similar to this. And I've also got a Wiggles ranking video which is like my longest video, even, even longer than this. And it's also my most popular video. Though, that's not really in the tier list style, it's more of a straightforward, edited, worst to best style, but still, go check it out anyway, even though I'd prefer if you watch one of my videos that doesn't have that many views. But as always, I'm the Cartoon Koala, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.